The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Our guest today, author Mary Stoltz, is the winner of the 1993 Curlin Award. This award is presented annually by the Children's Literature Research Collection at the University of Minnesota. Ms. Stoltz will be interviewed by Lois Rehnquist, Children's Services Librarian at the Minneapolis Public Library. Welcome, Mary. We're so happy to have you here with us at All About Kids so we can get to know you better. Let's start at the beginning. Did you enjoy reading as a child? Well, obviously I enjoyed reading as a child. I started reading very, very early and I have not stopped reading since. What did you read? Uh, I read a lot of poetry when I was a little girl uh, and I wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read just about it. I'm trying to Old Mother West Wind and all those lovely things of Thornton W. Burgess, and then I moved on to Pooh, and then I moved on to uh, Little Women, and so forth, into Jane Austen, and on to Samuel Johnson, who I oh, oh I love Samuel. Jo My uncle gave me Boswell's Life of Johnson when I was fifteen, and I have loved him ever since. And it's strange, he was no feminist, and he was a very pious man, which I am not a woman. And yet I love Dr. Johnson, his courage, and his diction, and his wise thoughts. Did anyone in particular influence you in your reading as a child? Yeah, uh, I think I, I did say this last night. I, I sort of based my character on what I was reading. And I was Joe when I was quite young, Joe March, Little Women. Uh, and I was flighty and, and opinionated and <laughs> a little wild. And then I decided to be uh, more ladylike, so I became Elizabeth Bennet from Pride and Prejudice. And I don't do that anymore. <laughs> now you're you. Try to be. Um, did anyone influence what you chose to read? Did anyone try to guide your My reading? My darling, marvelous uncle gave me books from the time I was a little girl. He didn't influence me, he just gave me books. All of Emily Dickinson, all of Keats, I adore Keats. Uh, he just gave me books and then said, you know, there they are. When did you begin to write? Well, about the age of five. And I did say my first uh, play I wrote when I was 11, and I sent it to Hollywood, and I said I want Ronald <laughs> Coleman to act in it. Oh, you even had the star picked out. They never even out. returned it to me. Hmm? Oh, did you try to recreate it then? No, no. You haven't? No, that's gone. Uh, you've written over 60 books for children, uh, for... Maybe twice that, a lot of rejections. Oh, not everything oh, no. mm -mm. was published. No. Uh, you wrote a lot of books for young adults early on, and then more recently you've written for younger children. Why in that order? Uh, I wrote for young adults when I wasn't too far from being one myself, and the older I get, the less I understand uh, what's called young adults or teenagers or adolescents. Uh, and I have a feeling that children to a certain age are more or less the same. I don't mean that they're predictable or anything like that, but they are, uh, I can reach children to a certain age where I, I think that teenagers today would find me quaint. At least all my teenage books go out of print. Oh. We still have some around, I think. Well, I'm glad they're around, but they're going out of print. Um, once in a while, uh, even as a librarian, I get the impression that people think, well, once you have enough experience and uh, enough wisdom, knowledge perhaps, one quits being a children's librarian and one starts to work with adults. Now. The same sometimes holds true for opinions of authors. Why do you continue to write for children? 
Our, Ursula Nordstrom, the greatest children's book editor, although the, I have a fine one, Robert Warren, who is with me now, but she was kind of the pioneer. She was offered a job in the train department, which is the adult department of Harper Brothers at that time. And she said, absolutely not. I am here to help children and to talk to children and to relate to children and care about children and care about what happens to children when they, when they become adults, and this is where I can do it. Right. So the same answer goes for me. Mm -hmm. It's because that's where you can make an impact. Yeah. Also, I, I have to add that uh, unless it's nonfiction, I, I find, well, no, there's some marvelous fiction being written, but I, I'm just not terribly interested in uh, modern fiction. Mm -hmm. I read back in the 19th century, mostly. Not altogether. Stevie Smith, wonderful. Some authors are known for their plots, some for their um, settings, others for character development. What interests you most? I can't answer that. <laughs> I'm not very good at plotting, but uh, I hope to develop the characters. What was the other uh, category? Settings. Settings? Mm -hmm. Well, I tend to uh, write, uh, put the settings in where I'm living. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I wrote for years about New England because I was born and brought up in New England. Now I live in Florida. And I'm pretty well resigned to that. Florida is very nice in some ways. And it's nice to write about. It's good to write about mm -hmm. the Gulf and fishing, all those things I had to learn because I didn't know anything about them. And that's interesting. Once you finish writing a book and send it to the publisher, are you then finished with it or do you still have work to do? Oh, no. Well, it depends. On a couple of occasions, I think I've actually had books taken uh, with no changes, only a couple. The, but even a couple is a lot remarkable. of, of uh, work. Sometimes, some books are uh, better written than others, and a good editor like Robert Ursula uh, will find uh, areas where you uh, can improve things, change things, make them more uh, meaning. Oh, I don't like that word, meaningful. Make them mean more or. Robert, for instance, now can find in a book things that I only glanced over that he thinks should come out and other areas that he thinks could really very well be pushed away or even discarded. He's a good editor, and I'm a writer who believes in editors. It sounds as if they've been very important to you. Oh, yes. Yeah. You started out re writing books for young adults at the time when young adults Red books, books were, yes, and were that a fairly new concept. And then suddenly you wrote an I Can Read, Emmett's Pig. Well, that was, that that was pure envy because uh, uh, Little Bear had come out and a couple of others that Ursula did. And, and uh, I said to Ursula, I should be able to write one of those. So I wrote about six. And finally she phoned me when I sent this in and she said, well, you've done it. And Emmett's pig came about. Yeah, the others disappeared. Uh, another of your ones for younger children um, was a series of fables about a pair of mice. Uh, it, I loved them. When I first read Belling the Tiger, I laughed out loud, <laughs> absolutely. Um, obviously, a lot of other people liked it too because it became a Newbery Honor book. Um, why animals? I love them. I respect them. I admire them. I think they behave so much better than we so-called higher species behaves. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm pretty big in the cat world, mouse world, pig world. Uh, I just love animals. I always have since I was a little girl. And I think I can write through an animal's uh, senses and eyes rather better sometimes than I can through a human being's. Mm -hmm. Then you did a book, A Dog on Barkham Street, about a boy who dealt with a bully. And then, it wasn't only the three boy years who dealt late, with the bully, yeah. it was his mother. <laughs> and then, about three years later, came The Bully on Barkham Street. You wrote the same story twice. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the first story was uh, in defense of my son Bill and me, who had put up with this boy named Martin, and I've forgotten his last name who was a terrible bully, and we really suffered for a couple of years. So I wrote A Dog on Barkham Street 
really for Bill to say, you know, this is how, it, this is my tribute to what a brave boy you're being, putting up with this person. And then a few years later, I realized that really Martin had his side, and Billy could be sort of a pest from time to time, not often, and maybe tease too. So I wrote, the dog on Barkham Street is set in the same time, with exact, but from Martin's point of view. And actually, I wrote a third one because in this book, Martin wants a dog so badly, and he promises everything that children promise, and he doesn't live up to his promises, and his parents take his dog away from him. So I was in Kansas City, and a boy in the audience said to me, couldn't you write a book and give Martin back his dog? So I wrote The Explorer of Barkham Street, but it didn't work out to give him back his dog. It just wouldn't work. So there, it's a trilogy. Well, they're great fun to book talk. I will, in case you didn't realize that, because you can say, well, this is the way he felt, but he, Martin felt differently. Do you ever, did you ever find out what happened to Martin? Yes, they became friends, and Martin's mother and I never spoke to each other again. <laughs> oh, most of your books are, <laughs> are realistic, like those, though um, not too many are based on real people, right? No, just those. But you also write fantasy. Uh, there's a story I know behind Quentin Court, a story about a pig who, discovering he... Um, He's going to be barbecued. Yeah. So he turns himself into a, a boy. He, he dresses up in the farmer's clothes. Uh, I have a friend, Noel Perrin, who is a fine essayist, and lives in Vermont, and at that time he was raising a pig. And he was, oh, a glorious boar. He was a lovely pig. And he had to be taken away and taken care of. And I just started thinking, you know, what could he have done to get out of this uh, fate? So I wrote this book for him. He's gone long. But it was, it was that pig. There's a story also behind the publication of that book, isn't there? If there is, I've forgotten it. What <laughs> was it? <laughs> well, um, I was trying to remember who published it. Oh, David Godine. He puts out glorious books, beautifully done books, excellent bindings. Every, everything's lovely, rag paper. <clears throat> fine, fine books. Mm -hmm. And it ended up on the notable list. Yeah. Well, I've had quite a few books on the notable list. Yes. Well, I mentioned um, Belling the Tiger was a Newbery honor. So was another one, Noonday Friends, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not too much later. That's an another one of the teen books. Sort of. I, I think it's more 8 to 12 or something around that. Mm -hmm. and, and that was late in Greenwich Village where I lived when I was a child. Uh, I love New York City. Where do you get your ideas for stories? I know that's a question lots of kids ask. I know it is. And I've told them I get them from living and looking around me and being curious and caring a great deal about this poor little planet of ours and what's going to happen to it. I, I try to, I get my ideas from looking around me. Do you keep a file of ideas? Mm-hmm. No. They just come. When and where do you write? I finally gave in and uh, agreed with uh, my son, Gene, to use a word processor. I don't, I, I still think it's a pity that the handwritten manuscript is gone just about. Uh, there are a few writers. Mario Vargas Llosa was, uh, geez, Chilean or Peruvian, isn't that awful of me to forget? Uh, I was at a conference once where he gave a talk, and somebody said, uh, uh, Senor Vargas, do you write with a word processor or a typewriter? And he gave this beautiful smile and said, I write with a pen, but he must be the last. And now I use the word processor and regret it in a lot of ways. On the other hand, I don't think I'd be writing if I couldn't use it. It's so easy. Do you write um, every day or? Just about. Just what? about. Are you an early morning person? Oh, a very early morning person and a very late night person. I don't sleep much. Um, do you work on one book at a time? Mm. Yeah, one at a time. I, I understand there are people who can do three or four at a time, but I can't. Some people write almost exactly right the first time. Mm. 
No? No. Not I. That's why the word processor is so great. Oh, you know, okay. you can go back endlessly and change and you don't have to cut and paste and scratch out and write on the back of the page. And the word processor is a wonderful tool in one way and uh, a pity in another. When we were talking earlier, you said something about you intended to start a book next Monday morning. Well, it's going what to have to be put off a couple of Monday. Well, I always start a book on Monday. It's a superstition now. Um, I don't know why. I can't start a book any other day. But this book's going to have to be put off a little because my brother-in-law, with whom I play Scrabble, and that's very important, is staying over a couple of weeks. He and my sisters live in Florida, too, six months of the year and go north six months of the year. And he and I play Scrabble every day. Every so, day? Every day. So he plays tennis in the morning and I write in the morning and then he, we play Scrabble. But he said he's going to be playing tennis in the afternoon from now on. So since I only write in the morning, I'm, I'm going to have to put it off. So you'll play Scrabble instead of... Oh, yeah, I'll play Scrabble. Mm -hmm. I can always <laughs> write. I can't always play Scrabble. Um, when, how long ago did you start using the word processor? About three, four years, I think it was. So there are Maybe manuscripts... More. Where you have, did you then write in longhand before that? No, no, I used a typewriter. Okay. But there's a lot of work involved, in, even with a typewriter, that is not involved with a word process. Mm -hmm. But if someone wanted to see how you do it, the creative process, they could go to the Curlin Collection at the university, Certainly right? Certainly could. They have quite a few of those where I worked on yellow paper and made all my changes on the page. So they can follow? If anybody wants to, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure that people do. Um, what about with the word processor? Will, they, will you still be sending manuscripts? Well, I asked uh, Karen Hoyle about that last I don't see any reason to send them. I mean, it's the finished product. There's no, there's no sign of, of the creation or the work. Or the, and there's a lot of work goes into writing a book. <clears throat> There's no sign of it when you finally get this this uh, this printed up thing. Do you print out different? Are there different printouts though along the way? I know if I'm working on something, it seems easier to print it out and then make corrections on the printout. No, I and then change go back. on the machine. You change on it completely. Mm. It's okay. a great machine. I just don't feel any comradeship with it, the way I did with my typewriter. Oh, do you still have the typewriter around? No, I gave it to my brother-in-law. We, we live in this condominium. And I have a little tiny studio, den, whatever you call it, a little workroom. There isn't room for the electric typewriter and the processor. So you had to choose. I chose. Who has influenced you as a writer? Oh, that's so, oh God, so many people. I mean, anyone who's read as steadily and indefatigably as I have all my life, I, I can't say. Maybe Dr. Johnson, though I don't see how. It's just that I love him, and I, I learned great courage from him. I mean, about courage, not, I didn't get any, I guess. I can't say. Poetry, I read a lot, a lot of poetry. Uh, at the moment, I think that Stevie Smith has me pretty enraptured, and a woman What's her name? Barbara King Solving wrote a book called The Bean Trees that I've read twice now. Enchanting book. So I do like some modern fiction. Yeah. Um, if you were working on something, uh, and this is, I think, part of what I was talking about in influencing, and you send it in to your editor, um, Ursula. Nordstrom used to have a, a line that she would... Oh, yeah, N-G-E-F-Y. That means not good enough for you. That meant work more. <laughs> <coughs> she would really make you buckle down and... Oh, yes, she was uh, very... Uh, uh, as I, an editor needs to be patient and needs to be obstinate and needs to be very, very stern. And she was all those, and so was Robert. Uh, but once in a while on a manuscript, she would write lovely. And it was, it was like an award. It was like a, it was wonderful. The books you've written, both chapter books and picture books, uh, have been illustrated by a wide variety right. of artists. 
How much influence have you had on the selection of those artists? None. <coughs> none? <coughs> none, none. The, the publishers picked the... I can say... Now, for instance, there was an a artist, N. Cameron Watson, and she is a dream, and she has illustrated a book called Weeds, The Weeds and the Weather, which is coming out next April. Uh, and I sort of found her by accident, and I, I really, I said to Susan Hirschman at Green Willow, I need her, she must do it, and they agreed. But not very often do I have much say. Many of your illustrators have been among the most talented in the picture book field. For example, um, Caldecott winners, Benny Montresor and uh, Uri Shilovitz, Emily McCulley. Notables. Pat Cummings is one of the most recent, and she's great. Yes. Do Pat you have John, Pamela Johnson, who did some books for Godine? <coughs> I've had lovely, excuse me, <coughs> I've had lovely artists, really fine artists, except something yeah, I shall not name. Oh, then I shouldn't ask no, who you're. No, we just won't talk about it. What about your favorite illustrator? I can't, there's so many I love. I love this Cammie Watson and Pamela Johnson, but Pat Cummings is, is uh, and then there's uh, uh, Alexander Koshkin, which sounds like a Russian opera, who has done the reissue of Say Something, beautiful stuff. And I bought two of his paintings. Did you? Yeah, from the book. Um, most authors get letters from children about their books. Um, which one of your books received the most letters? These Barkham Street books. I think those are the ones the kids like the best. I guess. Catwalk gets some. What's the best question a child ever asked you? Their, their letters are really more or less predictable. They're very sweet, and, and, and I welcome them all, and I answer them all. But I can't think that anybody ever asks anything particularly interesting. Just nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Usually they say how much they like the book. Once in a while they'll tell me they didn't like the book, which I find interesting. Uh, but I can't think that anyone has ever asked me a question that made me sit and think, how can I answer this? Uh, your most recent series of books uh, are set in Florida. You started out with a picture book where a young, uh, a young African-American boy, Thomas, and his grandfather. And, and his cat, Ringo. And his cat, Ringo. And then there was the duck. Goose. 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 Ivan, the terrible. Who, uh, and then it went to a, a beginning chapter book, Go Fish, and now Stealing Home. Um, I have to say that Robert Warren, my editor, got that title. I think it's the best title I ever had. Well... These are all about a black child and his life, and there has been much discussion lately. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us about that? Yes, uh, it seems that there is something called parallel cultures, and it means that we all go along on parallel lines divided by colors in our color-coordinated, differentiated cells, and like parallel lines, we're never going to meet. This is, to me, this seems what they're going to do to us, that only uh, uh, African Americans, Latinos, white, and I don't know how far this is carried, Muslims, Jews, Gentiles, I don't know how far it goes. Uh, I think it's preposterous. We're all human beings. We're supposed to be trying to get along among each other. I, that, that Rodney King question was so decent and so simple, can't we get along? We can't get along if we start separating artists and, and people this way, we're trying, I thought we were trying to come together and understand one another. And as far as I'm concerned, I am a human being living among human beings and I am going to write about human beings and I don't care what color they are or what color I am and I don't even care what gen genus we are. I mean, I'm going to write about animals and, and uh, black people uh, and white people and, and uh, leprechauns, whatever I am capable of writing, I'm going to write. And I will not be hindered this way by this, uh, although I may be hindered by it through, because I can't uh, prevent it. Though I have a book coming out next spring called Cezanne Pinto, and it is about a slave who escapes. He goes to Canada. He 
goes back down to the States, is briefly in the uh, Union Army, uh, goes to Texas and becomes a cowboy. And there are lots and lots of black cowboys, which now is being recognized, but when I started this book was not so well known, but there are a lot of black faces under those hats. And then he goes to Chicago and becomes a teacher. And my editor at Knopf says, we are we're going to run into a buzzsaw probably, maybe, maybe not, because I'm white and I'm not supposed to know anything about a black person, though a black person apparently can write and know something about me. Mm -hmm. I have heard someone say something exactly like that, which I think a lot of people me. are probably saying it. Uh -huh. um, do you ever read children's books by other authors? I write them. I don't read them. <laughs> well, then, but you have a favorite author from the past of children's books? Of children's books? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, probably Louisa May Alcott. Why her? Oh, it was such a lovely family, and they were so, uh, now, of course, they would be quaint, but then and they were so close and so decent to each other, and it was such a lovely world. Sad in a lot of ways, but but different than, than now. Which of all your books that you've written is your favorite? It, I have to say it's always the one I'm working on. <laughs> and what are you working on now? Nothing. <laughs> That's right, you're going back. Yeah, well, I have two books that I'm more or less going to work on, but right this minute I'm not working on anything, not till my Scrabble season is over. Then you can start. Yeah. Um, if you weren't a writer, what would you like to be or do? A cook. A cook? A cook. I've all, I used to think when I was uh, first married to a marriage that uh, was a disaster, I used to think to myself, now I could take Bill and I could go practically to any household in this country and say, I am a cook and a good one. And I come with my son and here I am. Now, I don't cook as much as I used to because I've discovered Mrs. Smith. Ah. <laughs> Commercials. <laughs> well, we thank you so much for being with us, Mary. It's been a delight. Um, we'll look forward to seeing your next Monday morning product. Very generous. And this is, the uh, whole experience here has been delightful. I've enjoyed good. it. Good. Well, join us again next week for All About Kids. Mary Stoltz, an author whose books are loved by children all over the country and by children's librarians. Thank you, Mary Stoltz, and thank you, Lois Rehnquist. Thanks to all of you for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency.